get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have a local Chicago, Jason Van Boom's founder of Active Campaign, which is a web-based marketing platform that helps hundreds of thousands of small businesses improve and automate their marketing. Jason, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Big shout out to Big Jason Henderson for introducing us. He absolutely loves Active Campaign, raves about it. I think every video I see of him or when yeah. he talks, he talks about Active Campaign. What is he? When did you meet Jason? What does he love so much about it? Uh, yeah, he, he just sort of appeared, you know, a year or two ago. He's like 6'10", yeah. so he doesn't sort of yeah, appear, but yeah. He appeared, you know, he really appeared. Uh, and um, yeah, he, he just initially was just came out as a, a very big fan uh, of the platform I think a lot of it came from uh, his experience with other platforms throughout the last you know 10 or so years uh, of shortcomings either from the product side the, the support side um, just found it to be a really refreshing uh, change for the market what gaps Jason does big Jason tell you oh this is this is what I was looking for from these other things yeah, so I think it's this giant gap in the marketing and automation space. So you have all your basic ESP providers like Aweber, MailChimp, Counts and Contact, um, companies like that. Um, and then if you want to get a little bit more advanced, you're typically having to make this giant jump over to like HubSpot, Marketo, Pardot. Um, and in the middle, there's really not a whole lot of options. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have things like Infusionsoft, which there's a lot of uh, frustration uh, about their platform. Uh, and We've kind of, kind of found this right fit for ourselves and the market of, of being the next step from these uh, ESPs, uh, taking things in a very uh, user-friendly uh, manner, uh, where we really focus on the end user over the purchaser and really focus on the usability aspect of it. Taking those automation features that you find in the enterprise solutions, making it so something a small business can use, and that really excites a lot of people. So, Jason, who's the sweet spot? Who should be using Active Campaign? Yeah, so it's really people that have already done some form of email marketing uh, and have something in place. Um, so, you know, we do have people that start off right out of the gate and, and start with our platform. But if you have that basis of, you know, you understand the concept of email marketing, sending out some sort of autoresponders or some sort of, you know, delayed email, things like that, we can take all of that and really take it to the next level for you. Um, and, and if you have that previous experience, um, we find that we can just show value very quickly. Yeah. And right before we hit record, you were talking about, you started to mention a transition, but I wanted to save sure. it for here. Yeah. yeah. So Talk about that. Yeah. You know, we've been around since 2003, um, which uh, sometimes surprises people or scares people, depending on how. Uh, it surprises because it's been around so long and they hadn't heard of it, or what surprises? Exactly. So, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we started as a perpetual uh, uh, software. People would download it, install it on their own server. Mm. We had a very private label focused uh, sale. So most of our sales came through resellers uh, throughout the world uh, that would rebrand the software as their own uh, and then provide all the support, the, the install, everything like that to the end users. Um, so we were very product You were behind the scenes. People exactly. were using you, but they didn't and know what we had, they were using you. Yeah, yeah, and we had really big brands using us even. Uh, like We even had departments of Fortune 500s and whatnot using us. Nobody knew, though. So we were just kind of this behind-the-scenes uh, product team, basically. Yeah. Uh, um, and during that time, we ended up creating eight different products. Uh, all of them were uh, contact focused, uh, so we had more help desk, more survey, live chat, all, all these different products that were part of a contact experience. Yeah. Um, but by 2010 or so, it was, one, we were so split up in focuses for a small team, uh, and that was one problem. And, and also, we just we were not happy with how we could not guarantee a good user experience. So people would download the product, they'd purchase it, then they would try to install it. Right then you have friction in the whole process. And uh, someone has a problem installing it on their server, 
we help, we could try to help, but ultimately that server environment creates, They're all different. Exactly. And and that could have a limitation. Then the end user looks at it and then they see it as, you know, we have a limitation. Um, when, you know, perhaps that's true to a certain extent, but we can only do so much to work around that. Mm -hmm. um, and then from a product standpoint, we were having to develop uh, the product in a way where it would work all these different areas. We couldn't use things we wanted to use, uh, third party anything, mm -hmm. services. I'm surprised integrate. you have all your hair. This yeah. sounds really stressful. So, on top of that, um, every month, uh, your revenue is completely different. So you're doing the license, you know, sales, and you try to get a reoccurring aspect with support contracts. It's really not reoccurring in, in the same style of, uh, you know, software as a service. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a, uh, we were doing well. Uh, we were growing, we were profitable, um, but it was definitely time for a change. Um, so we, we initially introduced just a version of our email marketing product at the time. Uh, as a hosted product mm -hmm. and uh, really it was just kind of this thing off on the side like you know you can buy the license otherwise if you're one of these people that like software as a service click on this little link find that and get in there uh, we found the demand uh, to be honestly quite a bit more than we expected mm. um, and then we started making this transition so of those eight products uh, we sold or, or, or started to wind down um, all of them mm. And uh, really tried making this long, awfully hard uh, transition over to uh, SaaS. So when did you transition to SaaS for the email marketing? Yeah, so it was in. It, we started very slowly in 2010, okay. uh, and then really by I'd say it's like 2012, 2013 is when it was at the forefront and the main focus. Yeah, um, much longer than. I would have liked or anticipated, um, but at the same time, we've always been bootstrapped, and we were switching from a model of where, where people would give us five hundred to fifty thousand dollars a license, wow. and switching that over to let's just. That's take hard to. Is that painful to give up? Like someone's offering you half a million dollars, like, you're like we're going to go to the SaaS business where people are paying a small monthly fee. Yeah, it's like even if you take like you know the small price point of five hundred dollars, uh, to even replace five hundred dollars with nine dollars or twenty nine dollars. Yeah. One, we're making less money even in a year. Yeah. Uh, two, we make far less money up front, so we have to wait for that compounding nature of, of mm -hmm. recurring revenue to kind of build up. Um, and that's why we took so long, is because we wanted to maintain uh, both growth and revenue and profit during the transition um, while still you know, getting switched over. It, yeah. it, it was a tricky process. Yeah, and Jason, I want to go back to the beginning um, sure. at some point about the idea, but there are two things I want to note before we go there. You know, I was watching some videos um, of, of Big Jason, and okay. I didn't realize there's misconceptions with Active Campaign, with affiliates and other things. What are what are some of those misconceptions that people are talking about that need to be dispelled? Sure, I, you know, I think it's a little bit of a less of an issue now. Okay, partially and thanks to him for trying to like kind of get out there and and try to calm down people that are just. Saying well, yeah, why were people up in arms? What were they saying? Uh, you know, it's it's so affiliate marketing. You know, you have different types of people that do affiliate marketing. Um, you have wonderful affiliate marketers, and then you have uh, lower value affiliate marketers. Just like any other industry, just like any other vertical. Sure, no, no different. Um, in our terms of service, uh, we've always said that affiliate marketing uh, is something we don't allow in the case of affiliate marketing where you just send out dedicated email ads to the same list with providing no value on top. I see. Um, so Someone's so just doing like solo ad after solo exactly. ad type just of thing. Take like a link of product A, shoot it to your list, a product B, shoot it to your list, and you do that like five or ten times a day uh, to 100,000 people. Every day, all these seemingly unrelated products half the time. Yeah. Nobody wants that. Um, there's no value add. Um, some people took that as, we don't like affiliate marketing. Even though we have some big name, we have plenty of people doing affiliate marketing with our platform. Uh, some people took it as, you know, we just have a hard stance against it. Um, we've cleared that up a little bit by just providing a little bit more uh, uh, help documentation about what is, is not okay, things right. like that. And then also our compliance team is just amazing in the way. When there is an issue, we reach out, we talk to someone, we try to work things out. Um, we never just close off an account. Right. And unfortunately, there were some people out there um, that quite honestly never even had an account with us that were going around saying that we just 
close out an account if they do affiliate marketing, which has never been the case. Um, so there's just a lot of misinformation going around in certain circles. Yeah. I mean, you have to protect all the people under who use you, too. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, and, and affiliate marketing is just mm -hmm. one uh, category of items. Uh, like, uh, affiliate marketing is fine. The solo ad, like email sending of a single advertisement nonstop to your list with no value add, that's something we actually don't allow yeah. in general. And it doesn't affect just affiliate marketers. We often find that uh, with some, like, uh, expos, things like that, that just shoot out ads to the entire list all the time. Yeah. And there's really no value out. It's just an ad that's going on. And we don't want to be part of that. Yeah. So what else, Jason, have you, as a founder and company, had to, you had to put your foot down on? Uh, on, like, different topics in regards to... Yeah, um, like, maybe or, stipulation, like, we're not going to allow people, like you said, to send out these solo mails every yeah. single day. What else have you had to put your foot down because of people are abusing it? Yeah, it's uh, certain types of content and, and whatnot, I'd say. A, a lot of it's behind the scenes, not necessarily something that's visible. It's, it's interesting the number of ways people try to exploit an email right. platform. Um, from every single feature you could possibly have, someone is trying to exploit it. Yeah, what do you all. mean by content? Tell me, what, what are uh, people trying to get away with? So some people will send something out. Um, they'll have content in there that's an image or something like that. Yeah. Um, that image will be hosted somewhere that they control, and then based on the IP address uh, that is actually opening that image, they'll change it up. Uh, so hmm. sometimes it will uh, be something that they want us to see, and sometimes it'll be something that they want to send. Uh, same thing when they click, and we've actually found people that uh, do that and try to f determine all of our locations for our compliance team and really? uh, uh, adjust things accordingly. Um, luckily, we have a system in place that we do hundreds of checks. We're constantly analyzing messages in different ways from different places, things like that. So we catch this. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, people spend a lot of time. That sounds pretty to, intricate. Yeah, just to try to utilize the, the, the reputation and value that our, our email sending uh, has. So is this like the porn industry? Like, what are we talking no, about? Oh, no, it's not the porn. No, what is it? What kind of images? It's just, uh, it, it's, uh, it's hard to say what they're going to like. It's not even anything like terribly bad. Really? It's, it's so just. Why, what are they trying to get away with then if it's not that bad? Because we wouldn't send it because maybe, because what it looks like, yeah. uh, how they do, how, how they set it up is it looks like a nice purely opted in. Um, value adding email. Um, what it actually ends up being is something that someone probably didn't opt in. It's more like a, a spammy email because exactly. they didn't opt in for that type of information. Yeah, and, or and they know trying, you're strict with your policy, and then yeah, and or they're trying to just get past any of our things because we don't allow adult, we don't allow uh, most gambling things like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so clever. <laughs> it, yeah. I, seriously, that is a lot of time. They could probably build their own like. A Weber active campaign uh, for that amount of see that that's that they could do that, but they the reputation that our sending has isn't easy to replicate, and that's not something they'd be able to do unless they actually start a legitimate business. Right, right. Um, integration relationships. I want to talk about. You know, I often see in forums and other places, active campaign always gets mentioned with this, like you know, oh, I have active campaign and Sam Cart, or I have active campaign yeah. and lead pages. So. Talk about, do you actively work with those partners or is that just like a natural thing that people couple active campaign with another company? Sure. So I think it's a couple things. So one, we do have a big uh, partner focus. Um, always have. It's, it's become a lot easier over time as we have this uh, much larger community of users that are passionate. Mm -hmm. So when they go into platform and they're like, why don't you have active campaign? They make the case for mm -hmm. us now uh, in terms of the value add for that company to integrate with us. Um, and then uh, also, it's uh, we've always had an approach where we we want to be that that automation platform where we're, we're a centralized platform in the way we have data coming in uh, through all points of a contact's experience, but we don't want to be the bloated like uh, all in one that some other platforms have chosen to mm -hmm. uh, uh, try to take on. Because uh, then what you end up with is you end up with uh, 
uh, junk e-commerce, junk everything, because that's not your main focus. We want to focus on the messaging, automation, and the sales aspects. Yeah. Uh, if we inc- include a shopping cart or e-commerce system, it's not going to be as good as a lot right. of the other options out there. Now, if we have uh, native and very seamless integrations where we can move data back and forth, an active campaign can be more of the data hub and engine of things, yeah. that that does add a tremendous amount of value, and, and then everyone gets the best of both worlds. Yeah. I mean, and it is time and energy for your team to do these integrations. You have to choose them yeah. wisely, and especially, yes. I mean, now you're growing a lot. When you're five people or 12 people, you only you have limited resources. Yeah. So talk about what are some of the ones you decided to go with and why, just so people hear your thought process. Sure. It's it's pretty simple, usually. It's based on what we see in the market and then also based on what we see with our customer base. Um, so, you know, we're working on some things right now where it's uh, we're having some very native and interesting integrations with e-commerce platforms. Um, and the decision from that was pretty simple from the get-go on what to start with, yeah. uh, just because we have... Uh, you know, people talking to our partners, people talking to our customers, feedback forums in place. Um, it's pretty easy to get that data. I, I like to keep things as more of a data-driven decision yeah. versus like, I think this platform could be cool. Let's yeah. integrate with that. So is it a number of requests? Like we need to have 12.7 requests before we integrate or what? what's the data look like that you yeah, can pull well, the trigger? Like, so kind of going back to the e-commerce thing, it's it's not even like nobody said like we want a native e-commerce integration. They're, they're not like overly specific, you know, but right. see the no need, one talks like that. Yeah. yeah it's <laughs> the need of, of getting data in a way where it's uh, more multi-level data and making groups of data actionable, especially when it comes to e-commerce and other categories. Um, so based on that, then we can kind of uh, uh, analyze our feedback, analyze our community, things like that, and what people are talking about uh, with platforms in that. Uh, and then we can just get a sampling of what are the top ones. Does that uh, match up with what we think uh, the industry yeah. kind of is, is saying as well and then take that and, and just take three or four um, to start and then from there we can see if demand changes. What's What are some of the most popular integrations that you have with other companies? Uh, so right now it's a there's, there's quite a few um, Zapier uh, remains a pretty big favorite obviously because that can fill in any, any hole of a native integration. Right, there. right. Um, we see e-commerce platforms like BigCommerce, Shopify, uh, WooCommerce uh, being uh, pretty solid. Um, and those are ones we want to make a little bit better and, and more native. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, Google Contacts, things like that. You How know, hard is it to, to do that integration with Shopify? So your you're team? very dependent on the platform. So Shopify... Uh, not that bad. Uh, big commerce, not that bad. Some e-commerce platforms, I won't name names, but like they're just it should it would it would be a nightmare. We're not going to touch it. They have a lot of users, but if they don't have the proper things in place, it's like the infrastructure is not there. Or why it's the development options? So it's either like you know they're lacking certain types of API calls or lacking uh, web hooks because we want everything in real time as much as possible as well. We don't want to be doing polling and things like that. Right. Uh, so that's another you know part of the decision on who to integrate with. You know. About what you're saying is you want to say stay tight. You don't want to make it bulky and try and do everything for everyone. And that can get tempting, right? I mean, early yeah. on, you have eight products. Well, so, yeah. so now, like, you know, what's that? Someone says, like, you know, I'll give you $200,000 for a contract, but I need feature X. And feature X isn't part of our direction. It's, you know, not part of what right. we do. Yeah, it's, uh, it's That's tough. what I want to ask is what's been tempting for you that you just still stayed the course and, and stayed disciplined despite being tempted with this well you know we could yeah so there it's not any like main one thing i'd say but it's all these little requests so mm-hmm. like whenever we do a feature people are like this is great but it'd be nice to have this option this option this option this option. people wanted to customize everything and, yeah. yeah and back in the day we kind of ran with that. We're like, okay, let's let's add in options. You know, we're development focused. We're you know, let's just add in more options because options are good, right? Features are good. Um, what we've learned over time is we're not selling based on features. We're selling based on on, on experience and results. Right. So limiting that, it might not be ide- like the perfect scenario for every single user, but overall, it'll it'll be better. Um, and and that's you know, we constantly kind of encounter that with yeah. every single update we do. 
Yeah, so I want to go back, Jason, for a second, because I couldn't find anywhere on the net of the inception and story early on of Active Campaign. But sure. first off, where did you grow up and what was an influence for you early on? Uh, so, yeah, so I grew up in a little town in Wisconsin, uh, a couple thousand people. Um, not a whole lot going on there. So, yeah, so what was life like then? What were you doing it, for fun? It was nice. It was, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it was, you couldn't really go anywhere because I lived in the country. So, um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's just spending a lot of time tinkering with things. Were you uh, in the computers when you were yeah. young? So, I got a, uh, Luckily, my parents uh, purchased a nice Packard Bell for me back in the day, and uh, it was a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful machine. Um, and I just started playing around with whatever I could on that. Um, shortly after, I wanted to learn like how can I get into building something, whether it's just like an awful program where I can just input something and it does something for me. Um, well, at the same time, I've always had this kind of like blend of passion for both art and tech, hmm. which typically... Why? Were your parents into yeah. art or why? Yeah, why so, yeah my mom uh, was, was an artist. Oh. Uh, um, and so I naturally started thinking like, okay, like, you know, typical, like, if I like tech, I like design, I'll start doing, you know, some web design or something like that. Um, so I was able to get some people to... Uh, Give me projects for that. Um, I, I had to kind of fake my way through that to a certain extent because nobody wanted to hire like a uh, twelve or fourteen year old. You know, um, I mean, you still look super young, so like yeah, I can't imagine what you well, look like that. So yeah, it's uh, you know, <laughs> so some people, you know, so I, I did some fun projects for that, um, and then once I got into high school, I uh, went into a program where I only went to high school for half the day. Oh, uh, really? I started working at an ISP for half the day. How uh, did that work? Like anyone could do that or how did, how did you get that? To I, so you have to like want to do it, but you have to find like a credi credible job to, to work at. So, so was this offered? How did you even find out about this? Like was this offered at your high school? It was offered. I don't know of anyone else that actually did it. Uh, <laughs> so you're like, I'm going to go to high school half day, which is pretty smart. So, yeah. Yeah. So I started doing that. started working on an ISP. That, that's, that allowed me to get a little bit more into, uh, you know, as, as I started off doing more like, you know, tech support, troubleshooting, a little bit of networking, some web design there, some basic programming, things like that. But that got me kind of into a little bit more of a formalized uh, way of doing things, a little bit more exposure to things that wouldn't have been exposed so to. So is that a random thing that there's an ISP company in a small town in Wisconsin? I mean... It is. So this is back, you know, this is also back in the day where, you know, people were still paying for dial-up connections. Um, so, you know, we had, you know, it, it, was a, it was a nice company, very small, but it was a nice company. Um, but yeah, and, you know, there was just rooms of all the dial-up connection equipment and things like that. It's... Probably yeah, so what'd you learn there from okay. working? This is like old school dial up tech company. I mean, yeah, honestly, what I learned the most there was how to deal with people um, mm. because I had such uh, so, so, so much work dealing with people that had problems, um, uh, varying educations in, in terms of, of technology. Um, so, and then also dealing with a lot of business customers. Um, so just kind of learning like what their challenges are, what they're trying to do, things like that. Cause it wasn't just the dial up access and whatnot. Some people are doing web hosting with those. So I got a good blend of both like hmm. uh, consumer and business experience. So what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were junior high, high school? Yeah. So I, I remember I always said, I just wanted to run a design company of like five hmm. or 10 people. And that was my goal. Design company. Yeah, technically, like like a, a web design, or what did that look like? What did yeah, yeah. So, but that's all I want too, because I liked that. I, I like the art and I like the technical. Um, mm. So you know, I, you know, at that point in life, that's made sense. Um, so yeah, and then after high school, I I decided I kind of wanted to be exposed to something other than um, where I was. It, it's a nice town and everything, but I wanted to try, you know, a bigger city, get to meet different people, things like that. Um, so moved to Chicago, uh, went to art school. Um, I didn't know that. So where did you go? Uh, the Illinois Institute of Art. Okay. So I, w I was there for a while. 
Um, so what do what do you study? What did you do at the Illinois Institute? I totally did not expect yeah, this at all. So it, it's not technical at all, really. Um, I, I think the study focus was interactive design or something like that at the time. They've changed the name several times, but essentially you're just getting a bachelor of finance. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I went there for a while. I, I managed to test my way out of uh, quite a few of the uh, uh, classes. Luckily, um, the only class. <laughs> that I couldn't get tested out of because uh, I don't think the person liked me for trying to test out of it was introduction to internet. And Are you serious? Act that you I couldn't test out test introduction to internet. All these other classes, but not that one. Um, was frustrating. Um, but yeah, I think there was a little bit of a personal uh, grudge against me there. So I picture you in a room, like doing sculptures. Like, what? What's it? What were you actually doing in your education? Some, yeah, so some fine art, like drawing things like that. Um, it, it jumped right into more illustration uh, and, and some graphic design. Some like that. You know, this is this is a little while ago, so like Flash was still a, like kind of a yeah. a thing and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, just a broad range of items. Um, so when I started school, uh, you know, I started the company, I think two months in, uh, something like that. Uh, so it quickly started taking off enough to you where started the company two months into when, uh, after starting college. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, so it quickly started taking up more and more time. Um, so I was trying to balance those things. I switched to, um, an online slash there for a while, trying to free up some time. I had a bunch of classes where they just really didn't care if I actually like showed up. Just get because it's a lot of like uh, art and project based work, right? Um, so you're you know as long as the end product is 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 nice, it's beautiful, then then all is well. Um, and then ultimately, it just got to a point where you know it's like I. I it makes no logical sense anymore. This is just like, why am I doing this? Um, just because so, you're spending all your time at yeah, the company. And, and I, I started getting it to where I was part-time and then part-time online. And then I started thinking, like, why? Like, this doesn't make any sense now. Like, the material I'm working on just doesn't really relate. And even if it did relate, I, I'm working at something already at a, at a larger scale. Um, so then I think I had, like, a, 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 like a semester left or something. But I uh, decided to just. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what was the initial idea for the company? Uh, so initially, I was I was dealing with a lot of freelance, a lot of contract work uh, for uh, websites. Uh, they always had a similar theme back in the day of wanting to do something with their contacts, uh, wanting to manage uh, different forms of their marketing. Um, so I kept building out like mini versions of an email marketing product for mm. newsletters and mini versions of like content management and things like that. Yeah. So I thought like, okay, why don't I just develop one and I'll just, you know, have it used by all these clients right. and it gives me some time. It, it can be a better experience for them. Uh, so it's kind of what I ran with. And then I just sort of threw it out there as, you know, let's, see what happens if anyone buys it on, on some sites and within a couple of days I, I started getting orders and it was it was like okay well that that might be a better angle to go with uh, than than more of a service-based approach of the consulting that I was so doing. Jason who is the early most memorable customer like really early on um, yeah so we had um, we had some interesting ones there was a uh, a scuba diving place, I believe, um, that just came out of nowhere from another country. Um, like, how did how were people finding you? Uh, so I was posting on like you know back in the day it was like hot scripts things like that where you had like downloadable like PHP scripts uh, and whatnot. So I think they're you know they're just finding me from there. But it was what was interesting is these these tiny like whether it's like a a coffee shop or a scuba diving place or something else. These tiny little companies which are wonderful companies. But in all these different countries, buying it instead of anyone like close to me at all, you know, which which makes sense. But it was it was eye opening to me at the time. Like you were getting these customers from all over the world. Yeah, and yeah. and to date we're we're only forty five, forty eight percent U.S. based. So really, we have a really big wow. 
reach. And part of that is because we've always taken uh, development with the idea of localization in mind, uh, but with languages and support uh, for languages. Um, so it, it makes it so that it's a better solution for people in different countries. Was it called Active Campaign? What What was the original? Yeah, so, it, so was. it was called Active Campaign. Um, wow. But we had you know these eight different products, and they were called different things at different times. Uh, we typically called the email marketing one Active Campaign email marketing, and then we had Active Campaign help us, things like that. Um, luckily, I chose a name that still kind of you know works for what we yeah. do. Um, so when we consolidated down, we thought. It just makes sense. We'll just, you know, keep it an active so, so what else were you doing to get business um, when you kind of got, when you realized, okay, I'm just going to do this one script or whatever it is and not trying to reproduce? Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I tried posting on places, things like that. That's what, that's what started getting some orders. I then tried to do pretty much everything under the sun to try to, uh, you know, capitalize on that a little bit more, try to get more sales. It all failed. It all fell right on its face. It all was a waste of money. And and the reason being is it was a hard sale to make uh, because someone couldn't just sign up. They had to have hosting. They had to know how to download the software, install it on their server. They had to know how to create a database in MySQL. Like it was a challenging setup. You need a technical product. customer. Yeah, and for a product I was selling at the time for like $85 or something like that. You know, that's a lot of needs for that price point. And, uh, you know, at the time there there weren't a lot of like SaaS solutions for email marketing. And from the product side, you had like Lyris, which was out there, which was the big name at the time. So I was competing with someone that had a lot more ad spend, a lot more resources, right. everything. For a downloadable product. What was the progression of the product? Like those eight products early on. Yeah. What was like the first one and then what did you build after that? So after the email marketing, uh, we developed a help desk product um, that had actually pretty decent success. Um, and uh, then we moved into... Uh, this was after like a customer requested this? Or? Well, it's, it's honestly, it's more like what we needed. So what we needed and where we couldn't find something I that see. Was, well, you as build a product it. company, we're like, okay, let's build it, and then we don't have to pay for it, and then we have a potentially a, a product that can you know, grow and live on over time. Um, so, and that's why everything was so contact-centered. Uh, so we had the help desk, we had the survey software, we had live chat, which was basically a, a addition to the help desk. Huh. Um, we had all these, you know, it, it was... It was interest. It was good uh, from a product standpoint and an experience standpoint. From a lack of focus, it it, it wasn't as good. So you went from email to help desk to survey to live chat. What else? What was next? Yeah. And with, uh, how many people at this point? Is it just you coding this up, or how did how did yeah, you do all this? Yeah. So you know, once we get through a number of those products, it's you know maybe five people at that point. I mean, it would seem like a daunting task for one person for all this stuff. Yeah. So what point did you bring someone else on? Um, within, you know, within the first uh, year. Or first year? It was, it was, it took a while. Um, I, you know, I, had, I don't think that's that long, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot to try to take on yourself. <laughs> um, but when we launched the help desk product, I think it was, uh, I think it was a couple people. How did you find those people? Uh, just people I knew. So people you knew? Early on, it was just people I knew. Um, and then uh, a little bit further along, we had a little bit more traction, uh, kind of knew what we were trying to do a little bit better, um, had some metrics in place. Then, then we could make some decisions on hiring. And then we went out and found some, uh, found some people that kind of fit those roles. Um, so... So email helped us survey live chat. Then what was what, what else? Yeah, so I have to try to remember all these. Uh, knowledge <laughs> You're like I'm trying to forget. <laughs> yes. Um, so we had a knowledge management product, um, <laughs> which sounds very vague, but it, it was essentially you know. It's called Google. What, what, you like made the early uh, form of Google. So and, and oh. actually we had some like the knowledge management product was interesting in the way we had them the largest companies uh, using it. 
uh, that we've ever had in any of the products hmm. um, from within film, within like the high tech sector, within all over the place. And the idea was just managing content of think like Atlassian Confluence um, or, or like any sort of like knowledge platform. So it's like uh, internal? Yeah, internal? primarily internal, can be public, but also mostly internal. Now, it was very early on, so it's not at all to the level of what like Confluence or anything else is today. Um, but at the time, there was there was a lack of options for that. What um, do people use it for, like that film company? Uh, internal. Uh, internal, uh, mostly employee information, things like that. So like guides for employees' processes, things like that. So it makes it searchable. Like what, what was... Well, it's I just, guess attractive it, to them. It's it's not rocket science at all. It's just having the data in a very collected manner, uh, where people can easily digest and, and search through it. Yeah. Um, and uh, having it so that you can have any number of users uh, with different permissions go in, make changes, and and approve changes to articles. You talk about it today, it sounds like the dumbest thing in the world. Back then, <laughs> there was a need for it. Right. Right. <laughs> So, yeah. so what else? So you have email uh, help desk survey live chat knowledge management. What else did you create? So we had a content management platform for a while, which okay. was slightly different than the knowledge management platform. Um, we had a time tracking application. This is something that didn't really take so off. So content enough. management, though, are we talking yeah, like yeah. like a WordPress type of like management system, or what? What did that yeah, look like? Yeah, more like site. So think like some simplified, basically taking a very simplified version of, of what some of the uh, site-based options out there would be. Like nowadays, you know, most people would opt for like WordPress or something like that to hand it off to a user. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was just something so that uh, a design company could manage multiple sites from a single location, uh, set up users to be able to go in and edit parts of the site uh, um, without messing up anything. Mm -hmm. And you, had a, you said a time tracker? What else? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was one thing. We can skip past that one, though. <laughs> um, so, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it was just like, past this, it's just like little things that, that are not, uh, not wonderful. So what were the top ones that got the most traction? Uh, definitely email, help desk, and survey, without a doubt. Um, the survey product, uh, we started doing a SaaS version of it as well. And we saw some traction with that as well, but it, it just we made the decision Took your that focus. even though help desk and survey they were making a, a good amount of revenue, they were they were they were progressing along nicely. Took the focus away. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. So, in the evolution of the company, yeah. what are some of the big challenges throughout? Yeah, so you know that changeover from perpetual to SaaS, I'd say, is by far the biggest. Um, both as a company, as yeah. a product, as understanding, you know, we're going from product focused all of a sudden having a much bigger need for support, customer success, the idea of having sales in the company, something we've never done before up until about six months ago. We've never had a sales team, never had anyone focused. How did you do sales. that before? Uh, what did you do? What was your it was process? All self serve. Uh, mm. So support basically took on any sales requests as a function of the support team, um, which they did a wonderful job at. But you know, when you're when you're in support and you're dealing with a lot of reactionary items, someone comes in with a question, you know, they might be from, you know, a big potential account, they're gonna ask about one thing, we answer the question all is well, but if we take it from a little bit more of a sales approach and we understand like, hey, this is a this is an opportunity worth, you know, X dollars We'll answer your question, but like, let's get the conversation started in terms of like, what are you looking for, um, where are you at with it, and things like that. So, what's the biggest challenge with transitioning to SaaS? Uh, it's, you know, it, it's honestly, it, it's it's handling your existing business with care um, yeah. because we've always tried to do the right thing for all the users that are with us. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to, even if we had the funds, even if we thought like a, a cold switch over would be fine, um, that's not something we would believe in. Um, so, you know, we have all these users that have used the perpetual version. We want to take the time to let yeah. them try out the SaaS version, understand, and we can make a very solid argument on why switching over to it makes sense. They're using well, a licensed version yes. and you're, you want to encourage them, hey, 
Yeah. We're building out this SaaS version. You and should, you should get you know, on. You know, initially, you know, it can be less for them. They, they have less control in the sense of it's not on their own server. Um, but when they factor in the time spent um, and if they value their time and whatnot, a clear argument can start being yeah. made for that. Yeah. I um, mean, to me, that seems like a benefit, not a disadvantage. Like, I don't want to manage it. Like, or, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Some, you know, sometimes people would think that they're actually saving money with that version. I see. Uh, so making the argument of, you know, maybe if you look at it, you know, comparing it side by side, maybe over time you would be. But if, you know, in, in regards to time that you spend on it and the value add that we're providing on top of things, it just, it starts to become a clear decision. Yeah. So what are other challenges? So transitioning to SaaS yeah. and getting the customers, you know, more uh, aware that, okay, we want to get everyone on the SaaS. What else is a yeah. challenge? So, you know, as we transitioned to SaaS, um, I wasn't happy with being an email marketing provider. I didn't want to be an email marketing provider. Um, seems like an awful business to be in. There's still a lot of room in the market and whatnot, but everyone it's essentially a commodity now. Um, everyone is just competing on price and, and, and variances of, of features and, and how they work. Um, so I always liked the idea of sending fewer emails more intelligently than mm -hmm. trying to just send mass amounts of communication. Uh, so marketing automation was kind of a clear fit for us to try to drive towards. Mm -hmm. And making that change uh, was also a little bit difficult because mm -hmm. while we had a lot of adopters that thought it was like amazing and they were really happy, uh, we also had people that thought we were becoming distracted, we we're switching focuses, we we're getting away from what they care about. If they're just using us for a newsletter, they don't really care about any of this. So why are we doing that instead of doing something regarding newsletters? Yeah, um, so what made you decide to start doing that? It's really to differentiate. And I think you'll see on the market now that everyone has kind of followed suit. Um, you see all the more basic email marketing providers like MailChimp, Campaign Monitor, and whatnot all have automation tabs now. Um, they're essentially currently still kind of like glorified autoresponders in the sense you send an email, you wait some time, send an email, wait some time, with maybe some things in between. Uh, so it's not really marketing automation. Um, but I think you see that shift in the market where everyone is trying to differentiate yeah. because as it becomes more and more of a commodity, you have to do something or your prices will be just driving down, down, down. Yeah. So Jason, what do you find the most, some of the most important marketing automation that you have to give people an example? Um, it's, it's, it's really just the prog progression of a contact. And so like when a contact first you realize a contact, whether that's from a form, they're visiting your site, they yeah. sign up for something, to, to have those touch points of email, uh, but then also uh, a key part in, in our platform, and I think in customer experience in general, is to extract when a human touch point is necessary, um, because that adds considerable more value than trying to over-automate yeah. things. Um, so that might mean use our contact sparing, use our site tracking, uh, use all of our features to kind of determine the behaviors of someone, right? Um, and then you 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 have automated you know messages or follow ups and things like that. But then it goes into a pipeline, it alerts people, it, it sets tasks for something to happen, yeah. so that you get the human. Yeah. human so involved. give an example of one of the companies that's doing using it successfully, just so I can visualize. Okay, this person like Joe, you know, opens an email three times, reads it, and then a uh, you know. Someone from their team gets alerted and says, yeah, you need so to call I'll, this person. Yeah. What, yeah. I'll use us as an example just so I don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so when <laughs> you, someone, you eat your own dog food. So yeah, talk yeah, about yourself. Very heavily. Like, yeah. yeah. And I'll try to give like a high level because we have quite a few automations in place. And yeah, yeah. But, I'd love to hear. Exactly. Yeah, I'd love to hear what automations you have in place. And yeah. Yeah. So for more of the sales side of things, we're constantly tracking everything anyone's doing inside the platform, uh, where they're stopping uh, with progression. So basically trying to create a funnel of when someone, when someone first knows about us from our sales site uh, and then gets into the platform where they fall off. Um, and then based on that, um, we have some automations that start up uh, when they create a trial, obviously. And then we'll send some emails based on engagement with that. Um, they may go into automated follow-up sequences, or they may go into a sales pipeline. Yeah. Uh, and then depending on perceived value of the account, which we're able to try to determine, just based on their actions and based on what they're looking at, mm. things like that, uh, it'll go to different parts of the sales team. And then we'll follow different sales processes for that. 
Um, once you get into those sales team and those sales pipelines, those have automations that help assist the sales team. So even though you're going into a sales pipeline, uh, we have automations to either you know send some follow-ups or kind of move them along in stages or help with the task follow-up. So if we know that if someone of a certain value comes in, they logged in, they created a campaign, they didn't do anything else, uh, we have someone reach out, we can have automated follow-ups um, based on do they do another action even though they didn't uh, reply to that sales rep um, or if they replied to that sales rep maybe we kind of exclude them from certain things move them along in the pipeline for that rep. So the rep ends up not spending as much time, and we save a lot of time there, um, but it's just intelligently knowing when is the human touch versus the automated. Right. So when does some, what actions do they have to take to enter the sales pipeline? Like what's an example of something they would do like, oh, they're no longer in this marketing automation yeah. pipeline and they have and now entered the sales pipeline. Yeah, so it's... Uh, once we determine where they're at in the stage of their and the value, I guess I'd say. Um, so, and that can be based on information they give us willingly in a form. Yeah. But that could also be in you know. So let's say you go in, you create a trial, uh, you create an automation. Okay. So your general interest in the platform, a little bit interested, maybe not enough information yet. But then you go in and you do something with the CRM in relation to automations. Just is this, a, this is a current customer, right? Mm -hmm. No, just a trial. A trial, okay. And this can be applied both to our sales site and to the product. So maybe even you're just looking at the sales site and you're looking through the automation features and then we see you browsing through the uh, CRM features. Instantly we know your, your, your minimum price point has gone up. Um, if you have interest in, mm. in the CRM, which is part of our mid-tier. Um, so then based on that, then we can start building an idea of what we think um, your potential uh, account size would be. Um, and then we can take in external factors of, of like what we think, right. what company you're from, size of the company, things like that, right. and, and use all of that to try to like build a profile about you. And uh, then we'll then we'll look at it and talk. To you. I love this. I love this this intelligence. So, on the site, like a new person going yeah. on, what ideally do you know when they click on this tab, they are like the highest value, best customer. Like I'm looking at your site, and uh, obviously you pay very close attention to design because you love yeah. that. So yeah. I suggest anyone for that that fact on go to Active <laughs> Campaign. Dot com and like you have the direct call to action, you know, at the top and everything's laid out, I'm sure, because for, for many detailed reasons. Yeah. But yeah. So what does that look like? You know, okay, this person clicks pricing the enterprise, then contact. This person is like our best customer. Yeah, and, and you know, it's uh it, it kind of along what you're saying of, of getting into the enterprise funnel uh, from a value standpoint. Um, then we have a pretty good understanding. But I, th I think the biggest thing is trying to differentiate whether they're looking for a basic ESP uh, versus uh, more what we're trying to target now. Mm -hmm. And trying to determine that is kind of just excluding. Like they're focusing on pages that have to do with email marketing, but then they, they don't spend a lot of time on any of the other pages like automation, CRM, things like that. Um, one, we might... Uh, it's just because we have all of that in the platform, we have all the automation even with the basic plans, it might be a lot for them to consume if they don't like it um, and they're not interested in it and then they might not be as ideal of a customer then. Right. Um, whereas if we see any, like when, once you start getting into automation, you know, you watch the little video, you go down, you get into some other pages based on that, you look at things like site and event tracking, then we know like we we have we have your attention probably at this point um, because these are these are items that you just simply cannot uh, find in our price point within this market. Yeah, it's, it'd be funny if like someone has a series of steps like they click pricing and they click something to do with email, then just a big red X shows up like <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is not for you. We are not yeah, yeah. we are not your what. Um, yeah, so I mean, you're trying to attract people who are more sophisticated with marketing automation, not just for a simple email. Yeah, service and provider. you know, so just two or three years ago, uh, pretty much everyone was just email marketing. Yeah. Uh, now I'd say about eighty-five percent of our users utilize marketing automation. Uh, in addition, 
Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's definitely where our strong suit is. So back to you know Jason, when I was saying the integration. Like, what's sure. the most popular user is Zapier? But what's something people like businesses you find? Okay, I need like I find a lot online. This is you yeah. need to get Active Campaign and SAM card or Active Campaign yeah. and something. What are the most popular? It's, besides Zapier, but like Ford running their business like automation. Uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of just uh, contact entry points. So you know that could be lead pages, drive themes, things, click funnels, things like that. I think that's probably in terms of volume the largest. Um, I, w- I would say it's just with how many integrations there are now, and how many integrations that are being created that we don't always know of. Uh, before our customers know of them sometimes yeah. because the companies don't even tell us and all of a sudden there's an integration live. Um, it, it's just so spread out. Um, but it's any contact entry point. That's why e-commerce makes sense. That's why events make sense. Um, yeah. What's Tell me a story of a company using the marketing automation that even though you created it, kind of blew your mind on how they were sophisticated, you know, how sophisticated they were in using sure. it. Well, I, I'd say from two standpoints. One, some people just building out things that we never imagined. Um, yeah, and like what? The, what does that look like? It looks like something where you have to zoom out for like days and then try to understand the logic of this. And there is logic behind it, and, and they map it out and things like that. But just the complexity that it can that that it can just create, and utilizing it for something that we didn't necessarily think it would be used for. Yeah. Like what? Uh, so what, what, are they, like, what would that like be? Even like, you know, taking customer success as an example. Yeah. Like, it makes sense. It wasn't our intention, um, but it makes sense. But people are utilizing automation and our sales features as a customer success platform. And it's not even just like sending out messages to people or anything. It's taking a lot of the ideas from sales and, and translating it into more of a support customer success style of, of touch points with accounts and things like that. And we've, we've done that ourselves now. Um, but it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's just taking things and, and we design it a certain way and, and with how many users we have, uh, they create all sorts of uh, fun things. So. On the challenge side of things and the good side of things, you said, you know, for a long time you were you went from five to twelve and we were talking you're gonna go to forty people. Yeah. So, so what accounts for the huge now from, Oh, forty from, people now. Yeah. Um, you know, this year we're expected to more than double that, uh, pretty wow. conservatively. So we're it's an interesting standpoint because a lot of the people, um, pretty much everyone that was at that twelve point and even at like that eight people point. They're still with the company now, right. um, so it's it's been interesting because we've had to change a lot of things from product support everything. So uh, from yeah, twelve to forty. Yeah. What was the huge growth spurt from that? It's uh, it's really getting into finding our fit more in this marketing automation space. Um, so it's just caused this this big influx of, of organic uh, uh, customers coming our way. Um, we're pulling from email marketing providers, and we're also pulling from upmarket, from more established players in the automation space, um, and that's just grew everything. You know, revenue, profits all around, um, allowing us to to grow. So, what kind of jobs are key for hiring from that the twelve to forty? That's a big uh, growth. So, sales was an aspect of that, um, and customer success was something we didn't have. We had our support team, um, but we didn't have more of a uh, proactive uh, support approach. So customer success mean they're already customers? Yeah. Uh, So, you know, our support team is more reactive in the way. You have a problem, you contact our support team, we'll help you out, we'll fix things, things like that. Now, from a customer success standpoint, we want to be reaching out to customers on on certain different frequencies uh, uh, to, to learn a little bit more about their challenges, what they're trying to do and work on strategy. So the more we can strategize with someone, uh, the more use value they'll see out mm-hmm. of the platform, uh, the more value they see, the more likely they'll be here to stay, um, and they can also educate them on, you know, so you're using automation, maybe you're using sales, but you're not using lead scoring or something. Yeah. Like Let's try to get that set up, and we'll show you why the value is behind that. Yeah. Um, and people just get more and more into the product then. Uh, and that's something we just started like a number of months ago. Yeah. Uh, 
and uh, that that's been uh, I think a pretty important part of it. And then from the product standpoint, you know, in development, you know, you can't underestimate the value of that um, with such a product focused company still uh, on providing you know something that is big UX uh, 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 focus, um, both on development and design. Uh, those are two critical pieces that are can be pretty challenging to hire for. So, I mean, when you go from, you know, you more than double, yeah. what are some of the things that, let's say someone is going, their team's going to be growing, their company's been growing, what are some things that people should watch out for when they, they have that big growth spurt? Yeah, I think it's, it's tr the biggest challenge we've had is just trying to hire fast enough. And it, it's, it seems like it'd probably be an easy thing to solve, but it, it's not because you, we went from this point of we didn't have any like good hiring practices in place. Right, right. You know, we went from five to twelve in the course of a really long time. Like we hired one person a year every six months. Right. Um, so getting practices in place for hiring, and then getting more people involved in the hiring process throughout the company. What um, works with hiring? Uh, do you do it yourself, or do you actually do you have another company? So yeah, we do a blend. Uh, so we have a lot of people reach out to us directly. We reach out to certain people that we know of or that people know in the company. Um, we utilize recruiters. We utilize different services that are yeah. essentially recruiter like in a way. Um, Unless you have a lot of friends, like early on, you're just hiring your friends. That uh, yeah, yeah, and you, and you that, reach like a limitation. Be the best hire, but yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, what so, works best with the that no, you found? Yeah, so we found you know that organic approach. People that came to us works really well. We found some wonderful people that way. It just doesn't scale very well. Um, so we've been relying more and more as of late on, on recruiters and different services to try to find people. Um, and that's allowed us to kind of pick up the pace yeah. and, and stay with it. I mean, even people who I know who they, they've hired thousands of people, they still have like a horror, you know, there's not a great batting average there. It, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely a little bit of an art over a sign yeah. in terms of, you know, it, it's, you're, 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 making judgments on a lot of things um yeah so now what what is it going to take so 40 and you're going to grow a lot from yeah. this point also yeah yeah so what are some of the big things that you know that you need to do sure now? so and, and the biggest challenge right now is the number of bottlenecks within the company and i'm probably by far the biggest bottleneck around um stopping progression within the company um not because i want to stop it right but you know with like give me an example of something that um so there's certain things with support with uh deliverability with design decisions with product development decisions things like that you need like, to put your stamp go, before it goes forward type of thing yeah or it's like i have you know i i know of all the different moving pieces here so i can easily answer something for someone within the company. Now that doesn't scale very well um, because as much as I'd like to talk to everyone all the yeah. time every day, I, you know, I can't think about like more product vision mm -hmm. going forward. Then. <laughs> so um, you know, getting key people in place for all the different kind of like buckets within the company, yeah. um, that's been what we've been working towards Yeah, and, and working on a little bit more of a, not, not structure in terms of like hierarchy of like, you know, Bob is better than, you know, someone else or something. But having people are overseeing certain things. Yeah, and just having like leads and things like that. So you can take one that allows a little bit more progression for people, um, in, in different focuses. So that's a been a big change yeah. as well. So like back yeah. in the day, everyone was able to do a little bit of everything. Whether yeah. it be support, development, features, bugs, everything. Yeah. Where now if we do that, it would be chaos is good, but that type of chaos is too far. So taking the chaos and kind of keeping it to a, yeah. a healthy amount of chaos. So Jason, if you look on the past year, what are you yeah. proudest about that you removed yourself as the bottleneck of? Uh, um, good question. <laughs> um, so a, a number of the technical decisions, I guess, I'd say. Um, so, so yeah, what did you do to remove, how did you remove yourself from that? Uh, so someone has just been taking more leadership in that role. Um, and then similarly with the support role, while we that's still kind of being worked on, mm -hmm. um, I 
very I, I I'm not involved at the the execution level of it as much. Yeah. So if there's an issue, which which removes that bottleneck, and those are two critical. Components. What was a technical one that you remember seeing that you probably previously would have had to oversee that you realized after the fact that it was already released? Do you, can you think of one of those? Um, where it went wrong, are you saying? No, not when it went wrong, yeah. but just that you realized that you didn't have to, you weren't the bottleneck, so you just realized it after the fact that before you probably would have been hands yeah, deep yeah. in making that decision or or shaping that decision, and yeah. then so we, you, you didn't have to Yeah, have. sure, sure. So we've been working on this uh, massive update to kind of how we ha have contact and deal management and whatnot. It's been team effort that's been taking on months, and there's been countless decisions there, um, both from a product standpoint and a technical from the technical standpoint i'm they they've gone way be like if i was part of the process i would have hampered everything uh in comparison to what they have put in place so far with what is going on um and quite honestly like i, I can keep up with with things um but they're doing far better job on yeah. decisions in that in that area yeah uh, just of getting the frame in place right. and making sure that it's something solid we can build off of in yeah. the future I ask that because I know everyone wants to remove them. Most of the time, probably, the, the, they're the bottleneck at some point. Yeah. And yeah. how do we remove ourselves as a bottleneck for all these things? Yeah. So you're saying what you did was you put someone in, like a team in charge of it, and then someone in charge of that team that basically yeah. handled that? And I, and I think a lot of it is like, you know, it, it's fine to be like to define the vision or direction of something. And say like you know this is kind of this is the goal because you have to you have to define something that coordinates with every other aspect of the company. Right. Um, but then have people in place that you can trust to actually execute according to that. Yeah. And you know they'll deviate from your plan a bit, hopefully in good ways. And and you have to let them do that. Yeah. Uh, so they can take some ownership of it, but at more of an execution level, so that it's still within the direction that's defined. You can kind of have both both parts. Um. Um. You know that that. The value of defining that direction while not holding it up. Yeah. So you set that vision and the the value overall, and then there's someone in charge to execute on that, and the team yeah, basically and, and, follows. Yeah, in, in getting involved at times, but trying to stay out of the the more minor details. Right. Of, right. And and trusting your team and trusting you yeah. actually made like hires and added people to the team that add a lot of value and yeah. think about things that you find to be important. And part of that is just making sure that everyone understands what you find important, expressing that and, and trying to get the entire team uh, to kind of believe in the same thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, what you do, you have, to, you have to wear a lot of hats. I mean, the bottom line yeah. is you're saying you're building an office. Like, you didn't sign up for this. You signed up for doing email marketing. Now you're yeah, doing, yeah. building out offices and hiring, you know, 40 people. Yeah. What's the toughest part of your job right now? Um, it's time. It's uh, just, uh, you know, it's time and determining what, what should utilize my time because there's limited time in the day. Um, and, and that's uh, been a challenge. But that goes back to trying to, you know, work on getting that balance of people taking, uh, you know, certain things, ownership of certain areas. Yeah. So, Jason, talk about some of the milestones of the past five years, like since you, you went the SaaS route. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, kind of doing a little more of a micro level, even in the last three, like three years ago, yeah. um, we finally reached to a point where, you know, we have a real SaaS business, like, you know, we can survive on SaaS. Like that, that was a, you know, it, it took so long to get there, building up that compounding nature of, you know, recurring revenue. And it was, it was frustrating process. Um, and, you know, I kept getting discouraged about how slow it was going, um, but then it was like a snowball. It just kept growing faster and faster and faster. Um, and then, so like a year ago, you know, we were feeling like we made great strides and everything. And then this year, and in particular within the last six months, it's like, wow, like a year ago, that wasn't good at all. <laughs> like, you know, we that, that was okay, I guess, but that's like sad compared to now. Um, in, in terms of where we're able to get our growth rates and where we're able to yeah. get our attention. Um, we're really working on um, improving retention and then also improving on expansion of accounts and not necessarily in like a, in just purely financial metric, but in 
what features are they using and, and what sort of value can we then show to the business because then if we can just focus on that everything else will fall into place financially yeah i'm always wondering like a company how do you do people have a dashboard on with goals like how do you does everyone know kind of what their I, yeah goal so is? i'm a, like a big data person right so so yeah, we we have uh, you know we have TVs with like dashboards and things like that. Um, I have some dashboards at my house just because I'm crazy. Yeah. Too. So what does it look like? Um, is it like <laughs> this, like a thermometer? Like we want to get to oh, this. So it's, it's uh, right. so yeah. So you have some goals. So like some quarterly or annual goals um, where we are currently in terms of subscriptions uh, and then key metrics like looking at uh, net churn, logo churn, uh, expansion revenue, um, sales metrics. On how our sales teams doing. Uh, same with CSMs and, and support. So, and the idea is to have different dashes for different people. Right. Uh, and then we send out updates to people, um, usually on a weekly basis, uh, just to show them, like, you know, hey, this is kind of how you did last week in comparison to other weeks, and here's how the team's doing. Gives you insight into just how are things going for everyone? Yeah. How are people progressing? Because that's what we always look for, is we look for everyone to just progress over time. Um, and, and we find that to be success here if you can just continually progress. Um, and yeah, and then every month or, uh, we do, I do a monthly recap and I just talk about everything that's kind of gone on, uh, within the company in the last month, yeah. what I've foreseen happen in the next month, where we are with all these key metrics, including financials and things like that, and just provide a ton of transparency. So it seems like an open book. Yeah, very much so. And then also it provides some accountability uh, for myself. Um, so I can let the whole team hold me accountable um, because if, if I have a month where I'm like, okay, you know, these metrics, wow, you know, we won't talk about these metrics this month. Um, I have now 40 people that can be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> and uh, so I can kind of explain things and they can, they can have a general sense. Because as you get more focused on something, you start to lose a little bit less knowledge of all the different areas. Um, so I think it's important to have that general uh, update for everyone. So was that a conscious decision or just progressed because you had a small team and everyone kind of knew what was going on with everything? Like you hear of, oh, what Buffer or whatever they have. Yeah. Basically, you could see every, like even I think anyone can see their customers, their revenue and everything like that. And they're open. Yeah, so we're not that far open, I guess. <laughs> right. we don't I don't think open. most people are. But. Yeah, yeah, but... um. But it's an interesting concept, certainly, um, and and I'd say, yeah, it's it's really just going down to like revenue. You know, ever ever everyone here can understand, you know, what customers' revenues are, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, health metrics on accounts, um, and then just the general like more uh, higher level financials and things like that, because yeah. that gets you an understanding of, hey, like we're like this is phenomenal, like. How are we doing that at, at our given scale? And you and want to keep doing it. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jason, this has been awesome. So, thank you so much. I um, always ask, since this is Inspired Insider, two things. One, what's been the lowest point in the business and how you push through? Sure. Uh, 2008. Um, 2008 was a fun time. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't say it was due to like the financial markets and things like that per se. Um, it was just a challenging time. I uh, got married, um, went on a honeymoon for two or three weeks. I come back and all hell has broken loose. Really? In terms of revenue, everything. Not because I was gone per se. It was just we had a couple product updates around that time right beforehand. Um, we were still in that perpetual model. And it was just a very rough time as a company um, where, you know, it basically took everything in my power to just keep things moving along. Um, and that was never really apparent um, to pretty much anyone here. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it took me to a place where I didn't want to go again. And that, in part, is what led to um, trying to refocus the company and to uh, uh, stabilize our revenue. And, refocus, uh, you mean cut down on the products or? Cut down on the products. So refocus on that and then also figure out a better revenue model where one, we can grow faster and two, it can be more stable. And SaaS kind of fills both of those very yeah. nicely. What was the most painful product-wise at that time when you did the product update? Um, it, it, it was 
even more so than the actual update, it was the fact that we spent time and resources on something that people didn't care about. Mm. So instead of updating uh, the email marketing like we should have been spending time on, yeah. we decided we're going to focus in more on our content management, more on our knowledge management. At the time, the market's shifting where you have all these other options going on there. Uh, it was a wise choice to focus on those. We devoted a lot of time. We only had like you know, five to eight people, or maybe six, somewhere around there at the time. Having a couple people focus on the wrong product was a big error. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, yeah. So it's realizing what you're best at, but also what else is in the market of what yeah. you were doing that is going to capture the market that's maybe a waste of your time. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough, especially after you get from, you're supposed to be relaxed after your honeymoon. Yeah, it, it was not a fun, you know, and it took, uh, you know, I'd say it took like six months at least to like actually be somewhat more stable personally, um, you know, and, and that takes a toll on, on you as a person and, and you know, it, it, it will affect the company because it's, it's hard to uh, completely stay away from things. Yeah. So how do you manage that then going home? How do you disconnect? Yeah, well, well, then, yeah, it, it wasn't. There's no, uh, there's no. Because you have dashboards at home too, so you can't get away from <laughs> yes. it. Yes, yeah. Well, I didn't have one then. Oh, okay, but but I'm also the type of person where I always know our metrics, regardless of that, because I have it on right. my phone and I probably look at that yeah. an unhealthy number of times a day. Like I, sh I probably don't. <laughs> Up to the minute, like AR and net churn. And stuff. You wake up at two in the morning. I just got to check this now. That's the first thing I look at. Yeah. Right. Very unhealthy. I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest doing that. Um, For someone but, who's not balanced, which I would say most people who run businesses may yeah. probably error on that not balanced side. What do you do now? Do you do anything to help you disconnect from that so you're not completely stressed yeah. or thinking but, about it? My family helps me kind of force me to do that in a, in a good way. Um, so when I get home, um, I, I do try to disconnect. It might just be for an hour or two, but I, I try to like actually like just spend some time, you know, without being on my phone. Um, and uh, then, you know, it's, it's I'm getting better at it. It's uh, it's pers you know, it's it's not because I feel like I'm adding some like tremendous value. It's just I am extremely passionate. You're about obsessed it. with your business. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. You so you tinker with drones with your kids to take your mind off it or something. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the that's been a great you know thing for me because all you know spending any time with them it's just very simple. They they put things in yeah. a nice perspective for me. So on the flip side, Jason, what's been one of the proudest moments in the business? Uh, it's really been this last you know, six months or so. It's um, showing the type of growth rate that we're experiencing, um, improving upon that growth rate when people say that we're going to be decreasing, um, and then proving that wrong and uh, just building it up further. It's just been a, it's been exciting um, with all sorts of new things and, and tons of problems, but, but good problems to have. Um, and, and we're going to have some less exciting challenges in the future i'm sure um but right now it's just been a, a really fun experience so what have you done to celebrate um nothing nothing crazy nothing overly you're fun. getting a new office yeah we're getting a new office so we're what's exciting in the future that yeah. you're most excited about for active campaign um it's it's the sh continuing shift so what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to make the uh the, the sale and, and the reason to go to active campaign more about a contact experience and less about feature 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 um and this is something that i think we'll see um slowly progress over the year because we want to take kind of a, a a soft approach to it as we have with everything so far yeah. um and, and really diving into being more about that contact experience and that might mean you know additional features expanding on things we already have um, but making it less about like we have email marketing with feature X X X X X, you know, it, and more about the value we provide. Um, and I think why I find that exciting is um, one, people realize the value as part of the sales process. They'll see it as part of the success and support process, and and that'll translate to all of our metrics. Yeah. What about the proudest as far as customer success goes? Where you, what was one customer that has a particular huge amount of success? Using Active Campaign, yeah. So just like the other, you know, I, get I know you have some case studies. Yeah, we have some case studies, but 
honestly, the the more valuable items I find are just people that email me, and it's it's a small shop, it's a small store or something like that, and they're like, I just wanted to say thank you for building this. Like, you know, we just created a small, and it's not even like complex automations normally, just we created a simple, you know, follow-up sequence on our customers, and we just saw our sales go up 40% or something like that. Yeah. And it's it's dollar-wise, it's not like, it's not like, Huge, but it's huge to that business, right. and and how unique all these little you know these nice small businesses are. It, it's yeah. I find that to be just fascinating. How yeah. much reach we have in regards to that. Yeah, what's one of the most unique type of businesses that you, that are on the platform that you were surprised? Um, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's literally all over the board. Um, we've had some some interesting. Uh, um, organizations, I guess I'd say. Um, we've had things that are like nonprofits. We've had like uh, Earth Hour and whatnot do all their campaigns with us. We've had some political um, things, which are interesting of its own category. <laughs> uh, I won't get into that, but um, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's just all over the board. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Jason, I want to thank you. This has been fantastic. Everyone should check out activecampaign.com. What should we leave people with after everything we've talked about? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just trying to look at your business and thinking about what could save you some time and uh, what you're trying to accomplish and, and how you could utilize some form of automation to to accomplish that and and really just reaching out to us because that's a big task for a lot of people the thinking of like how or like what would I set up so the tool is there but how do you use it and, and we recently released an update where we actually provide a bunch of sample recipes and workflows for common businesses hmm. on certain that's areas. cool how you how you could automate customer success how you could automate like more of a net promoter type of uh, setup how you can automate you know just keeping nurturing someone along the sales process and then we're here to just if if, you know, just start that dialogue and we can usually, you know, save you a ton of time in figuring out what it is. Yeah. So you spend less time yeah. on the uh, execution side. Time is precious. Use automation. Yeah. Go back to, you have a million things to do. You have the offices and employees. Jason, it's been absolutely fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out if you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand